it'll make sense, a video, it'll make sense to you when you see it. To our prophets, Father in Christ and most illustrious Prince, forgive me that I should dare to write to you. I make bold because it is my duty to serve you and to warn you of the crooked practices of those who claim to represent your grace.
He made a difference in the time and place God called him. Uh, today, many churches around the world, literally around the world, are celebrating his bold and courageous act of faith. And we're going to consider that God wants you and me to make a difference, like Luther, in the place or places God has called us. Now, lest you think you're not as significant as Luther, let's think about him for a few seconds. <clears throat> He was actually a no-name monk in the eyes of the world. I mean, the world didn't know it. He suffered with a deep sense of guilt about his sins. He lived in an insignificant village of Wittenberg, Germany. His uh, lecture <clears throat> and lectures were in an unaccredited, unnamed university. He had no political, social, or religious power. But God moved on his heart. God revealed his grace, love, and forgiveness to him as he read and studied Holy Scripture. Now, from his studies, Luther set forth the five solos. And these five solos are still important for the church today. <clears throat> and they're important because they still mark off the Reformation Church and the Reformed Church. And you have the five in the bulletin. We are justified by grace alone, through faith alone, on account of Christ alone, to the glory of God alone, as revealed in Holy Scripture. Those five are the significant things on which Luther said the church stands or falls. And that got written into the Augsburg Confession in 1530, and you probably We'll go read that when we're done here, right? <laughs> now, Luther, like many of his days, had a seal to put on letters, and this seal was put on his book. Books, and um, <clears throat> you have it in the very front of your bulletin, and it's up on the screen. He commissioned Lazarus Spangler to do this, and then he wrote a letter to him to explain each of the things in what's called the Luther Rose. The heart is central on it. It is, then it has a prominent cross black because the cross mortifies. Of course, that's an old word, means to kill or put to death. And should also cause pain. Yet the heart itself, he went on, retains its natural color, red. Why? The cross does not corrupt nature, that is, it does not kill, but the cross keeps alive. And if you know anything about Luther, the cross was central to his preaching and teaching. That's where life comes from. And behind the red heart is a white rose. For white is the color of spirits and angels, as he found it in Matthew 28. The white rose is to show that faith in the crucified gives joy, comfort, and peace. Such a rose should stand in a blue field, a sky blue field, symbolizing that joy in spirit and faith is the beginning of the heavenly future joy, which begins already, but is grasped in hope, not yet revealed. Surrounding it, you'll see, is a golden ring <clears throat> symbolizing that such blessedness in heaven lasts forever and has no end. Heaven is exquisite beyond all joy and goods, Luther said. Now Luther called this seal a compendium or a summary of his theology. Now you can go online and you can get all the symbolism. I didn't write that up in the thing. Well, two teachings that show that the Reformation is still important today for the church and for you and me are the priesthood of all believers and the vocation of believers. So first, the priesthood of all believers. Luther believed what he read in 1 Peter 2.9, that we are a royal priesthood. You're a royal priest. Now, priests in Luther's days were an elite group. Because, their ordination, because of their ordination, they had power to speak the words of institution 
over the bread and the cup, and it became literally the body and blood of Christ. And that mystified those who watched. And on hearing a person's confession, they had the power to absolve her or his sins and direct the kind of penance one would have to do. And how many and how for how long? So it resulted in a church with two groups, the clergy and the people. Now, I mentioned this in the last service. We still suffer from that. We expect the clergy to be about everything. <laughs> to be doing the work while we watch. Two people, the clergy, pastors, the ones you saw on the screen. I'm glad they didn't put me up there. <laughs> but anyway, pastors and people. Instead, instead of church or kirche, because Luther didn't like that word, it reminded him of this two peer reality in the church. Instead, he used the word all the time community, Gemeinde. You see, in community, Luther concluded we are all priests, as many as are Christian. Priest, bishop, or pope are neither different from other Christians nor superior to them except in their office of preaching and administrating the sacraments. And I'll say a little bit more on that later. I mean, Luther's essential teaching is every Christian is someone else's priest, and we are all priests to one another. So look at each other, go high priest. I, I know you Presbyterians are probably not going to do that. But. Husband and wives, don't be afraid. Just look at each other, go high priest. Hopefully when Graham comes, he won't push you so much. <laughs> Paul in 1 Corinthians 12 sees all believers in Jesus Christ, all Christians, as members of the body of Christ. And this means that you and I can no longer be lone rangers doing our own thing in community. Now Paul says, to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit, spiritual, a spiritual gift or gifts for the common good, for our good. And this means that all of you sitting in this room have gifts or talents <coughs> to be used here. To pastors, the Spirit through the people of God affirm their gifts for preaching and administration of the sacraments. Now I want you to catch the difference. It's the people of God who set aside people to do preaching and sacraments. And that's how it works here. If we find someone gifted, we say, we think you ought to go on and get prepared to preach and do the sacraments. And we send them to session, they fill out papers, and then we send them to seminary, and then they come back and we hope they haven't been destroyed. I mean, we hope them come back with great joy in ministry. But see, it happens because of what you do in electing, suggesting, moving people to pastoral ministry, whether it's men or women. But all of us, pastors included, have a responsibility to bring Christ to our community and to serve in some way in our body. Now, is this the image that you have of community here? Now, Luther writes this, and keep in mind this is 16th century. This is from, his, from Luther works. A cobbler, a smith, a peasant, each has the work and office of his trade, and yet they are all alike consecrated priests and bishops. Furthermore, everyone must benefit and serve every other by means of his own work or office, so that in this way many kinds of work may be done for the bodily and spiritual welfare of the community, the Gemeinde. Just as all members of the body serve one another. 
Now, <clears throat> some of you have seen this paperwork. It looks like I'm preaching a long sermon, but I'm just going to show these. Uh, I mean, throughout the week, and actually yesterday, we had someone do Gifted to Serve. And many of you, I've heard, because we've been doing this at this church for quite a long time, have taken this class, Gifted to Serve. Really great stuff in here if you haven't picked this up. But then, uh, throughout this week, we've been encouraging you to take the spiritual gift assessment. And then we give you a sheet, actually longer than this one, on how to assess what you wrote down. Now these are in the back. If you haven't done this, I want to encourage you to find out what has God gifted you to do so that you can really participate in a deep way. And then after worship, in your bulletin you have one of these. So please pull it out. This is connected to the mission fair that's going on in Fellowship Hall, and it's a way for you to sign up and get involved and to use your gifts. There are lots of things on this, and I'm sure that you have at least one of them, maybe more. So after worship, I'll remind you, go to Fellowship Hall. You see, God wants you to put His gifts to work here in our community. So, priesthood of all believers. If you sign up for something today, it will show that you have a heart to serve others or each other as a priest. You can be priests to each other. Okay, the vocation of believers. Luther believed that we are all called by God, that is, we have a vocation. His idea of vocation actually flowed from his t teaching on the priesthood of all believers. I mean, they, they work together, actually. For Luther, Christians do not need to cast about for places to exercise their obedience. We were given a place by God. Marriage and family could be single life, citizenship, church, politics. I mean, each person, lay and clergy alike, is called to work in the world, not just in church. I mean, plain, ordinary work is transformed into Christian vocation as you and I exercise our faith in active love in the world. I mean, work is no longer just a job or occupation. It's a calling, a vocation. Not in the sense that, you know, you need vocational training. The training came when God called you. It's a summons from God. So vocation is also where the Spirit sanctifies the Christian life in humble service to our friends and neighbors. Here's what Luther uh, wrote about vocation. When a prince sees his neighbor oppressed, he should think, that concerns me. I must protect and shield my neighbor. The same is true for a shoemaker, tailor, scribe, or reader, or you can put any other vocation in there. If he's a Christian tailor, he will say, I make these clothes because God has bidden me to do so, so that I can earn, earn a living, so that I can help and serve my neighbor. When a Christian does not serve the other, God is not present. That is not Christian living. So God calls all Christians to a life of vocation. To have a vocation means to live out one's call. So for the Christian, <clears throat> that call is answered in the structures of daily life. Family, work, state, service to neighbor, care of creation, all kinds of things. As the setting in which we try to live out the identity of the gospel and the call of God on our lives. So my call to each of you on this Reformation Sunday is to think about how you can make a difference in your world. 
if you're a business person, a construction worker, if you're in the tech community, a homemaker, in real estate, in banking, a stockbroker, whatever it is, if you're retired even, do it for God. That's what the Reformation is all about. Whatever your vocation, you don't have to be a pastor to make a difference. Let me say that. Can you see me? You don't have to be a pastor to make a difference. Amen. Write it on your hand in case you forget. Because we tend to think just the opposite. So, figure out the way that you can leverage what you're good at and lead where God has placed you. You can make an extraordinary difference with the skills and talents God has given you. Now remember this, you only have between this day and your final day to make a play for God. So do something beyond yourself that will serve others and will help heal our broken world. So here's my last challenge. Go to the mission fair tables. Sign up to use your gifts and affirm your vocation that you've been given from God. Let us pray. God, thank you that you not only call us to be your sons and daughters, you call us to be priests to each other, to the community here, and to the community outside us. And I pray, God, that you will help us to say yes to the gifts you've given us, and to begin to live them and use them day by day. We ask this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen.